Our first speaker this morning is Brother David Wisniewski from the Detroit Livonia, Michigan Ecclesia. The theme for Brother David's classes this week is Eden, its revelation and restoration. Today's class is entitled Promise of Restoration. It's been an interesting journey, has it not, as we've considered those things that our Heavenly Father revealed in Eden. As he revealed that he had a plan and a purpose with the world that he had created once he got to the creation of man and of woman. That his intent is to fill the earth with his glory through a host of people that will manifest his character and exercise spiritual discernment and teach their children to do likewise. And that in that context we saw that he revealed his memorial name and he blessed Adam and Eve with dominion with a special land and by giving them access to eternal life. We saw that he wants us to share in his work and we were reminded of that yesterday as we went through the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sacrifice that was performed as it were from the foundation of the world, the one that provided a true covering for Adam and Eve. Because even though they had interrupted God's plan, the plan would still be executed because our God desires to be a father and a father pities his children and has mercy on them. And so in the context of transgression, we saw the full revelation of God's character, that which we are supposed to emulate and so as we go forth with the commandment to reflect that character, we see that God's strength is made perfect in weakness, that God's character is revealed in weakness, and that when our brothers and sisters fall out of weakness, it's our opportunity to reveal the character of God in us. And we consider the garden was a place where God desired to dwell with men and women who aspired to be like him. And as we went through, we saw those blessings peeled away because of the transgression of Adam and Eve. But then yesterday, we saw that Adam and Eve were given the opportunity to have access to the tree of life once again. And that that promise of restoration was given before Adam and Eve were even cast out of the garden. And so if the covenant of Eden, the first of the three great covenants, was the initial phase of the path of restoration to the garden, does it not behoove us then to consider the other two great covenants of promise and see how and if they relate too to the blessings that were given in Eden? And how merciful is our God, as we considered yesterday, that before he even cast them out of the garden, before he even took away the blessings, he already made that first covenant and showed how they would be able to come back again to the tree of life through a sacrifice that he would perform, a sacrifice of his only begotten son that would give them and us access once again to the tree of life. Well, we come then to the second great covenant, the second great promise that God made, which was to Abraham. And we're told in Genesis chapter 12, after God goes into the darkest part of the nations, goes down into the land that was developed by Nimrod, the son of Cush, goes down into Assyria and Babylon that we saw was prophesied in the mystery of the four rivers, a territory that would be overturned because in that territory there was a teaching that was contrary to the ways of God. There was a teaching that was based on the thinking of the serpent, reasoning that left God out of the picture. And into that, into the heart of that system, God goes and he takes a man and a woman and he pulls them out. <clears throat> And so James would say in Acts chapter 15 that God at the beginning did call a Gentile because Abraham was a Babylonian living in Ur of the Chaldeans. And he called him out of that system of darkness with the desire to develop a people that would be a witness of God's character in the land 
a light that would draw all people unto them. And he says of Abraham when he responds, Abram when he responds, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, that last phrase is of particular importance as it relates to Eden. Because when God created Adam and Eve, there were no nations. There was no Israel. There was no America. There was no Canada. There were no nations. This was the mother of all living, we're told in Genesis chapter 3. And so any promise of restoration related to the Garden of Eden has to be a promise that would affect, well, all the families of the earth. And so we've met our first criteria then for the promise made to Abraham to be related to the restoration of Eden. It has to be a promise that will affect all the families of the earth because it was made originally, the blessing of a special place, a special land was given originally to the mother of all living, to the parents of all the families of the earth. And Paul expounds this, doesn't he? In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the word is people, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now sometimes we as a community come to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, And we read those words and we say, well, therefore, the gospel was preached to Abraham, so let's go back to the life of Abraham and look at all the promises that God made to Abraham, because therein is the gospel. But that's not actually careful reading, is it? Because that's not what Paul said. Paul didn't say God preached the gospel to Abraham through all the promises that he made to him. He says he preached the gospel to Abraham Through these seven words, in thee shall all nations be blessed, all the families of the earth. Why? Because this connected the promise to Abraham back to the blessings that were given in Eden, that was designed for the whole world. It was designed for all of creation. It was designed for any male or female that would choose to reflect the character of God in their life and to exercise spiritual, exercise spiritual discernment. And so the gospel is contained in these words. In thee shall all nations be blessed. All nations, all people have the opportunity then to partake of the promises that were made to Abraham. And as we continue with Abraham, we know, of course, that the the bulk of the content of the promises made to Abraham has to do with a special land. After Lot had departed from Abram, God tells Abram to lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed Forever. And so we have a promise of land that's given to Abraham. Furthermore, just a few verses later, he says, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And we have on the screen before us a map of the journeyings, the possible journeyings of Abraham as he traversed from north to south and down into Egypt as well and then back up. And we can see that Abraham traveled across that land that was promised. But Abraham had actually walked much further than just in the land of Canaan, hadn't he? For he had come from Ur of the Chaldees, all the way down there near the top of the Persian Gulf. And he had walked along, well, either the Tigris or the Euphrates. So the land that Abraham walked in was actually encompassing Babylon and Assyria 
all the way over to Lebanon and then down into the coast of Israel, all the way down to Egypt was the territory that Abraham had walked in. Well, then with Abraham's seed, when they settle the land and the kingdom of God in part is established upon the earth with someone sitting on the throne under David and Solomon that recognize they're sitting on the throne of God and acknowledging that this was the land that was promised to them, we can see that the settlement of the land went quite north. This is the largest expanse under the rulership of David and Solomon, which we rightly say was a fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, but of course, only a partial fulfillment. It was only a partial fulfillment because it was only one nation, the natural seed of Abraham, that was there. And yet the promises they made to Abraham was that all nations would be blessed through his promises. And of course, the area of settlement does not go to the extent of the land that was promised to Abraham. Because in Genesis chapter 15, God had said unto thy seed, which Paul expounds for us is a singular seed, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the Lord Jesus Christ have I given this land from where? Well, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, that's interesting. So the territory promised to Abraham was not the land in its totality that was settled by Israel because they only actually settled a small portion of the land that God said was promised to Abraham. Abraham had been promised the land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, all the way to the Euphrates. And we can see that here on the screen. So that was the territory that was promised to Abraham. And so our brother Sully when he lays out a map of the future tribal allotment of the 12 tribes of Israel, once they're restored back in the land under the Elijah mission, when Christ has set up as king, he shows the tribal allotment going from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River. Now, it must be that the territory promised to Abraham would be that central component, that location that the kingdom of God would be ruled over from. And so the territory promised to Abraham that was promised to his seed, that was promised to the Lord Jesus Christ then, is the territory that would be sort of the first dominion that our Lord Jesus Christ sits over. The region of the capital, as the United States has Washington, D.C., a region dedicated to the government of the country. And so the region dedicated to the government of the country was the region that was promised to Abraham who was told, unto thy seed, says Paul Christ, have I given this land. And when we turn over to Psalm 72, we find a definition of that land. If you would open your Bibles, please, with me to Psalm 72. Psalm 72, we've been to before. A psalm about the rulership of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the last prayer of David. Verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And David's mind was all upon the kingdom of God that was going to be established and the promise God had made that his son, God's son, would sit upon his throne. And it says then, down at verse 8, he shall have dominion also... That is, Christ shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Well, we see an echo there, don't we, to the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis 15. That his seed, Christ, would inherit the land from the river, the Nile River, unto the river Euphrates. And when we come to Psalm 72, it says that the dominion of Christ will be from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth, and that it will encompass a territory known as the wilderness, and they that dwell there would bow before him. And so we assume the first sea must be the Mediterranean Sea, that 
runs along the coast of Israel. So there's the definition of one of the boundaries of the territory that Christ will reign over. Of course, Christ will rule over the entire world, but there will be that territory that he rules out of. And then it says, the river. And if a river is stated and called the river without a a definition of which river it is, it must be that great river, Euphrates, that Abraham was told he would inherit, that his seed, Christ, would inherit. And so we have our boundary there along the uh, west, northwest side. And then we say the river is the Euphrates, and we have a boundary then across the north side of the territory that Christ will rule from. So what is the other sea, and what is the ends of the earth? Well, we'll define the ends of the earth because it'll help us then understand what the other sea is. The word ends means ceasing or finality. No surprise there. It's the word ends, the ends of the earth. But what about the word earth? It is the word eretz. In the theological word book of the Old Testament says that Eretz designates either, so there's two definitions, the earth in a cosmological sense or the land in the sense of a specific geographical or territorial designation. So two definitions. And then it goes on and says, here's an example of where those, that word Eretz is used these two different ways. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's the word Eretz. And the second way is used in why Genesis chapter 15. At verse 18, unto thy seed, unto Christ, says Paul, have I given this land, this Eretz, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So in the context of the Nile on the one side and the Euphrates on the other side, what is the end of the land? And so we go back to our map, looking now just at the second definition. We'll come back to the first definition when we come to the covenant made to David. We go back to our map then and we say, well, what is the ends of the earth? Starting from the locations we've been given here with the sea and the river. Well, it would seem to stop, wouldn't it, at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. And so then, as we continue to draw our borders, we would come down to the Arabian Sea and come along the Arabian Sea and come back up. Well, that territory seems awfully familiar, doesn't it? the territory that was actually promised to Abraham, the territory that will be the center of the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ's reign, the territory that Paul expounds is promised to Christ and to his seed, well, it just happens to be the same territory that was promised or given, rather, in Eden. And it says then that they in the wilderness shall bow before him. And well, that wilderness is Saudi Arabia. And so we go back to the territory that was given to the children, sorry, to Adam and Eve in the land. And we saw that the territory matches the same territory that was promised to Abraham. So in fact, brothers and sisters, the promise to Abraham to give him a special land... Well, it was just a restoration of the blessing that God had already given to Adam and Eve and to their progeny. And so all of a sudden we see that the covenant of promise given to Abraham, 1,500 years after they were expelled from the garden, has its context actually in the Garden of Eden wherein all of those things were revealed concerning the plan and purpose of God, where the first sacrifice was performed, showing how God would still execute his plan even after Adam and Eve transgressed. 
And so Paul is able to say that the gospel was preached to Abraham in the words, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Because the blessing of Abraham is the restoration of Eden. The restoration of that special land that had been given to them. And how do we then participate in the promise that was made to Abraham? Well, this is part of our first principles teaching, is it not? As we bring somebody through those first principles and preparing them for baptism. We see Paul's exposition in thee all nations shall be blessed. And how do we participate? Well, Paul continues on in Galatians chapter 3 at verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we saw this verse when we were looking at Genesis chapter 1, didn't we? Male and female. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Not only are male and female one in Christ, but all the nations of the earth can be one in Christ through baptism. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we're shown through the covenant made to Abraham how we can inherit that special land that was first given to Adam and Eve and then removed upon their transgression. And so if we want to be part of that family, Paul expounds as well in Romans, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only that of, not only Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. And so it's faith in God's plan and in God's purpose to fill the earth with his glory that allows us to participate in the promises made to Abraham in the restoration of Eden. And so there's the second part of the path of restoration. The first being the covenant in Eden, which gave access once again to the tree of life. Upon Christ's death, the sword of the cherubim was lowered, and he entered in and partook of that tree of life and will give us all access to eat of that tree as well at some point in time, hopefully very near in the future, brothers and sisters. And then through the covenant of Abraham, he restores access to the garden and to Eden, to the place where Christ's rulership will be established. And so that leads us then to the last, the last component of restoration of the blessings that God had given in the garden. And well, that happens to be dominion, which was, of course, the subject of the promises that God made to David. David had desired to build a house. Why did he desire to build a house? Because he understood the principle that was established in the garden that God desired to dwell with men. And God tells David that because he had been a man of war, a bloody man, he's not able to build that house. But his son Solomon would build that house. And we know how David responded. He wasn't bitter that God had rejected his plan. He prepared mightily for Solomon to build that house. So that when Solomon came to the throne, the plans had already been laid out. In fact, did you know the plans to... for the house to be built in Jerusalem were actually devised when David was a teenager and when he was spending time with Samuel in Ramah where he first fled from Saul. And it tells us in the record of the Chronicles that it was there that they started laying out the plan for the temple of God that would be built, a place for God to dwell with his people. And at the end of his life, he prepares mightily for that house to be built, a place that God had chosen to put his name in, Zion, where God desires to dwell with his people. And after telling David, no, you, you will not build the house, but your son will build that house, he gives him this promise. 
I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And of course, David understood that this was in part partially fulfilled by his son, his son Solomon. But in that this throne and this kingdom was going to be established forever, that he was going to be the son of God, this pointed forward to a greater son, to the son of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're told in the promises to, Ab- to David that there will be a reestablishment to the dominion that was taken away from Adam and Eve when they were cast out of the garden. But we might say, well, wait a minute. When we looked at the promise to Abraham, one of the prerequisites for it to be the restoration of the Garden of Eden is that it has to be applicable to all the families of the earth, to all nations, to all peoples. And in 1 Samuel chapter 7, in the covenant that God makes with David, it seems to be that this dominion, this rulership, is just given to Christ. Well, since we're in the Psalms, we'll turn over a few pages to Psalm 122, where we see that the intent of the promises to David about dominion extended beyond just that seed, the Son of God. Psalm 122, reading from verse 1 down to verse 5. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of Yahweh. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. And so we're told here that in Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, there won't just be one throne, there will be many thrones of David that will be set up in that day. And this thing seems to be confirmed, doesn't it, when we come to Revelation, because Jesus will share his blessing. We read in Revelation 1 verse 6 that the redeemed will say in that day that thou hast made us kings and priests unto our God. And so when our Lord Jesus Christ was victorious over the flesh and rose again, he will share the victory with us. Not only is the sharing of the victory redemption, from our mortality, a change of nature and freeing us from the prison that we're in, having led captivity captive, but he will also share with us the dominion that was promised to David. It said under the law concerning priests, if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then thou shalt arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And he chose Zion, the garden of Eden. And thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, in the kingdom age to the saints that are sitting on these thrones of David, says Psalm 122. And they will judge in those days and inquire And they shall show thee the sentence of judgment, and thou shalt do according to the sentence. And so we're given a vision in Psalm 122 that inside the temple that Ezekiel sees in his prophecy, there will be thrones of judgment in the outer court, scattered throughout the outer court. And when we go, brothers and sisters, by our course the course that David established with Samuel at the end of his life recorded in Chronicles, just as the father of John was up serving in the temple in his course, 
Perhaps it will be two weeks out of the year that we will spend in Jerusalem, having been assigned in that day to our territory that we are to rule over and to teach to be the word of God to the mortals that are upon the earth. We will, with the mortals of that town or city or region or nation, depending on the authority we're granted in that day, we will, with the mortals, come up to Jerusalem to worship the temple in our course. And while we're there, we'll take a turn sitting on one of the thrones of David in the temple. And no doubt we'll have a turn to sing in that beautiful choir that's there in the temple. And we'll take our turn receiving the sacrifices of the mortals and taking them up into the most holy and up to the altar that's on the top of it. Do you know what the uh, temple in the age of the kingdom is called? Well, it's, it's called the Tabernacle of David. It's called that in Isaiah, and it's called that in Amos. Why was it called the Tabernacle of David? Because David understood that the place of worship in the future was based on the principle that God had established back in Genesis, that he desired to dwell with a nation. God desired to dwell with men and women that would manifest his character and would exercise spiritual discernment. And so when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, he didn't put it back in the tabernacle that was confined by the law of Moses. He put it on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite where both Jew and Gentile could come into the presence of God together because he understood God's intent was to dwell with men and women of all nations. And so the promises that were given to David was a promise of dominion, a promise that would be achieved because of the victory of one, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, but would be shared with those that had strived to exercise, reflect God's character and exercise spiritual discernment. And we will say in that day, thou hast made us kings and priests unto God and to his father. We read of the same in Daniel chapter 7, don't we? And I beheld the same horn made war with the saints. That was the horn of the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. And it prevailed against them until the ancient of days, which our presiding brother mentioned in his prayer. Until that time and judgment in that day was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. And in Revelation 3, verse 21, to the last of the seven ecclesias, the Lord Jesus Christ says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. And so our Lord will share the throne of David. Not just one throne, but many thrones that are set up in the temple that will be the center of worship for all people. And I saw thrones, John says in Revelation 20, that were revealed unto him in that vision, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Well, if we desire to be there in that day, brothers and sisters, then we need to learn to judge now. Wasn't that Paul's exhortation to the Corinthian Ecclesia in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? If you would please turn your Bibles there with me now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul reprimands some in the Ecclesia at Corinth. At verse 1 he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust? And not before the saints, the brothers and sisters in the Ecclesia? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? There was the same message that Paul gives and uses it as a basis of exhortation to the Corinthian Ecclesia and to us. If the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? 
Know ye not that we shall judge angels, most likely speaking about messengers in that day, in the mortals? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, do ye set judges who are the least esteemed in the ecclesia, who have no experience with this, other versions say? I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother instead goes to law with brother and that before the unbeliever. And so Paul reprimands the ecclesia at Corinth on the basis of the promises to David and on the basis of the restoration of the blessing in Eden of dominion that in that day we will have the dominion that was promised to Adam and Eve in the seventh day that God will rest. And those that have tried to reflect God in their lives will carry on God's work during that time. And Paul says, if we want to be a part of that, if we want to exercise dominion in that day, then we better be judging matters now in the ecclesia. And of course, when we examine the words of Christ, especially in Matthew chapter 7, we see his exhortations about judgment, don't we? That we need to first learn to discern ourselves, that we need to be able to look inwardly and judge And if we do that, says Paul, then there will be no judgment at the judgment seat because we'll already have done Christ's work in judging our own lives on a daily basis. And so learning to judge starts with learning to discern and look inwardly at our own lives. And then Christ says in Matthew chapter 7 that once we've learned to judge ourselves, which develops, he says in Matthew chapter 5, a poor and a contrite spirit, Well, then we're in a position where we can start helping other people with their sin. And he goes on in Matthew chapter 7 and expounds that we need to be able to judge. We can't judge motives, but we can judge fruits. We can judge the outworking of other people's actions, which are based on their motives. And he gives a parable at the end of that of of a man who builds his house on a beach and it falls apart, and another man who builds a house on a rock and it stays standing. And the outworking of that individual is obvious based on whether the house stands or the house falls. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to learn to judge if we want to be a part of the dominion in that day. Well, where is the dominion? We saw the center of dominion. We saw where the dominion goes forth from in the promise made to Abraham, that it was the territory of Eden that God had set up in the beginning. But let's go back to our verse in Psalm 72, verses 8 and 9, because it says there, dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. And we saw that there was another definition of the word Eretz. We already considered the first definition, that it was the extent of the land, the ends of the land from the Euphrates. We went south and we go to the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. But the word also has a second meaning. That is of the earth which God created. And so the dominion which is centered in Jerusalem... will extend not just to the Euphrates River, not just to the Arabian Sea, not just to the Persian Gulf, not just to the Red Sea, but the dominion that is there will extend unto all the ends of the earth. It's a stone that becomes a mountain which fills the earth, a mountain being a symbol of a nation or a kingdom. And then we read that they that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. And we said that that was indicative that those that were in that Arabian wilderness will be a part of the territory that is given to Christ when the kingdom is established. But actually that word wilderness in its primary application is much broader than just those that dwell in the Arabian wilderness. 
The word is used just six times in the scriptures, one of them being here. And one of them is in Jeremiah chapter 50, speaking of the destruction of Babylon, where it says, therefore, the wild beasts, that's the same word for wilderness, the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts, the same word again, of the island shall dwell there. The owls dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever. And so now when we looked at the expanded definition of Psalm 72, when it says, they of the wilderness shall bow to him, the wild beasts of the desert, the wild beasts of the islands will bow before Christ. All of a sudden, this is an expansive verse, not just limited to the territory promised to Abraham, not just limited to the territory of Eden, but actually talking about all people defined as beasts or as fowls of the air that will bow before Christ in that day. And all of a sudden, we come back to our first class once again. That we have the opportunity to rise from the rest of creation, from beasts to men. And that when men, being in honor, understand not, they're like beasts that perish. And so the mortals upon the earth, we're told in Psalm 72, verse 9, the wild beasts, as it should be translated, shall bow before him. But actually it's quite specific. It says of Babylon that there will be wild beasts dwelling there in that day. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah 34, a passage we've visited earlier in the week. A passage that speaks of the judgment of the nations. How do we know? Because we come to verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth. Well, it's just all people, the all nations, that will actually receive the gospel proclamation in the day of the kingdom. It's the same language that's used in Revelation chapter 14 of what we call the mid-heaven gospel proclamation, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ has returned, is sitting upon the throne of David in the Garden of Eden and is calling for all the wild beasts to bow down before him, for all nations to be subject unto him. But in this case, it's obvious what the response of many has been. For we read at verse 2, For the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. And so the all nations in Isaiah 34 are part of the people that heard the gospel message, the proclamation to submit to the rulership of Christ, the Son of God, who had the victory. And these are those that have rejected the call to submit. And so it says in verse 3, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be metal, melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven, that is the governments of the earth, shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. It shall come down upon Idumea, people who have the spirit of Edom that hated Israel, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And it says that when the destruction of that land where the nations assemble to rise up in rebellion against Christ when the destruction is completed, it says at verse 10, it shall not be quenched, the fire shall not be quenched day or night. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So total will be the destruction of the nations that rebel against Christ. And then in verse 14, it says, the wild beasts of the desert, the same word, wilderness, in Psalm 72, verse 9. 
The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. The satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Isaiah 34 is actually a vision of the nations that rebel against Christ's command to submit, being destroyed, utterly destroyed. And we understand from other Bible prophecies that the territory that all nations that will rebel against Christ, where they gather, will be in Catholic Europe under the leadership of the Jesuits, we believe. And there they will assemble all the people of the nation, symbolized by the beast, and they'll decide they're going to make war with Christ and the saints. But part of the dominion of the saints, one of the first acts of dominion that's given to them is to judge those kings. And the destruction of the armies in that land, of the beast in that land, will be so complete that the land will be emptied. And then it says, as we saw at verse 14, but there will be other creatures that will come and will go and dwell in the wilderness that's created when Catholic Europe is destroyed and those nations that would rebel against Christ. And you know, all of the creatures that are described that would dwell in that wilderness, all of the creatures in verses 11 to 15 are actually all birds. Because the beast was destroyed in Revelation chapter 19. Those that assembled to rebel against the dominion of the Son of God will be utterly destroyed. And the other mortals that dwell upon the earth will flock to that territory, as it were, so that they'll be within a closer proximity to the temple that will be in Jerusalem, so that they can flow up to that temple and worship God in Jerusalem. And so the dominion restored starts with a proclamation that the Lord Jesus Christ is king over all the earth. And Psalm 2 and Isaiah 34 and and Revelation 19 speaks of nations that will reject the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Psalm 149 says that we will execute judgment first upon these nations. Let's turn there, please. Psalm 149. It's a time of great rejoicing, as we read in verse 1 of Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and praise his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king, Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises with the timbrels and harp. For Yahweh taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the nations and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. The rolling or the dissolving, rolling up or the dissolving of the heavens as it was described in Isaiah 34. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye Yahweh. And so the first execution of judgment that the saints will share with the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be bringing all nations into subjection to Christ's rulership, because the goal of the kingdom, brothers and sisters, is to make all things subject to God. In the end, even mortality and human nature. And at the conclusion of this process, there are new kings of the earth, as it describes in Revelation 21, verse 24. Even as Daniel had seen in the vision and the kingdom and the dominion, Even to the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens is given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is a kingdom age enduring, and all dominions do serve and obey him. And so, the covenant of David is the last step in the restoration of the blessings that were given in Eden. 
Well, this to me was a huge revelation. I had not understood that the three covenants of promise were all connected in this way. That they were actually the, the restoration of the blessings that God had already given in Eden. And we said at the beginning of our class when we first started to consider the blessings that God gave in the garden, how our God gives us the benefit of the doubt. Before they'd even had the opportunity to make a choice between life and death, God had already given them dominion. He'd already given them a special land. He'd already given them access to the tree of life. And then he gives them a choice between life and death. And even when they chose death, God said, but I I really want you to have life. And so he made a way through his son. He made a way in such a way that it would demonstrate his love for the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not just any son, his son. Because he wants us to have life. And he wants us to share in the blessings that he gave back in the garden. And through these great covenants of promise that are at the center of our understanding of the truth, along with God manifestation, we see then a restoration and a path for us to get back to the Garden of Eden, where God dwells and waits for all the families of the earth to join him. So if we want to be there, brothers and sisters, in that day, let us have the faith of Abraham, faith in God's ability to perform that which he has promised, and have the faith of David, faith that God is able to forgive sins and to set us back on the right course, even when things seem insurmountable. And let us learn to judge now, first in our own lives And then in our ecclesias, knowing that in that day, we'll be sitting on thrones of judgment, judging the mortals of the earth. 